Hello and welcome to the National Association of Plant Breeders webinar series, The Science of Selections. My name is Deb Yabeuf and I will be serving as your host for this webinar. Today's presentation will be given by Professor Pat Moore from the Department of Horticulture at Washington State University. Dr. Moore works on processing raspberries and on fresh and processing strawberries. The emphasis of his research group has been to study and breed for resistance to raspberry bushy dwarf virus, virus Phytophthora rootworts, nematod, and verticillium on raspberry. Today, Dr. Moore will be speaking about raspberry breeding and genetics in his presentation, Raspberry Breeding for the Pacific Northwest. After the presentation, you will have the chance to ask questions. We will answer as many questions as we have time for in the question period. And now, I'm going to switch control of the screen over to our speaker, Dr. Patmore. Hello. I'm uh, Pat Moore at WSU Puyallup, which is 300 miles away from the main campus in Pullman. The, I head up the raspberry breeding program at Puyallup. At Puyallup. Uh, Wendy also works on that program as well. And I have cooperators with Dr. Chad Finn with the USDA at Corvallis, who also works on breeding raspberries, and uh, Michael Dossett, who's up in um, Canada, up in BC, who also does work on raspberries. These three programs are the only public breeding programs in North America that are working on um, processing raspberries. So it's a small group of us, but we cooperate very closely together. Okay, um, program support for the breeding program Muted. is through Washington State University. Also, other sources are the USDA uh, through the Northwest Center for Small Fruit Research, and then the uh, commodity commissions in both Oregon and Washington, and then uh, some from plant royalties and then also from hatch projects. Uh, first, uh, where in the world are raspberries grown? Uh, the leading producer of raspberries is Russia, and then this in 2013, it was followed by the U.S., and then by Serbia, and then by Chile. Um, for whatever reason, the, the FAO does not include Chile in their reports, but that's where it should be, is, is someplace right in the top four. Um, 2012, Serbia was ahead of the U.S., so it, so it flip-flops back and forth from year to year but those are the big players. Uh, in the U.S., uh, California is the leading producer of raspberries, uh, followed by Washington and then Oregon. That um, California is, produces pretty much exclusively fresh raspberries, whereas Washington it's 99% um, processed, and Oregon it's about 88% processed. So very different markets different breeding objectives. Okay, some taxonomy. Uh, red raspberry is in the rose family. The genus is Rubus. Uh, there's a subgenus, and it's Idiobatis. And then the species level is Rubus ideus. And then there's two subspecies. The European red raspberry is Rubus ideus vulgatus. And the North American red raspberry is Rubus ideus strigosus. Um, even though that's, they should be subspecies, they're commonly referred to as Rubus ideus for the European red raspberry and Rubus strigosus for the North American red raspberry. Okay, uh, red raspberry is a diploid with a chromosome number of 14. Um, all of these species that are listed here I've used in crosses between the species and Rubus ideus, and I've been successful in getting the hybrid between the two. Uh, they may not be real fertile, but I do get, I have gotten the hybrids. Uh, those that are marked with an asterisk, I've also been able to cross those back to the hybrids back to red raspberry again, um, so they're, they're reasonably fertile. Uh, those in red are the ones that are native to North America. The ones that are in black, most of the black ones are native to uh, Asia. 
uh, Korea, China, some in that area. And just showing an example of, of some of these that uh, Rubus parvifolius is thimbleberry. It's native to the U.S. Um, crossed it with a red raspberry and the next panel over is the result. You can't see it real well, but there are a few small droplets here and we were able to grow those up. I think I may have some hybrids that are back to red raspberry again from that, um, but maybe not. Then um, the next one over, Rubus nominatus, it has long fruiting laterals. Um, with many, many flowers on it, and I've been able to work back crossing that. One of the more interesting ones is the bottom one here, Rubus sumatranus. Uh, it is, has many, many droplets per fruit. Um, you can see here that there's all sorts of them. There's maybe, uh, w people have counted and, and find like 700 droplets per fruit. Um, I have gotten a hybrid with between the Rubus sumatranus and a red raspberry, and I've tried several times, but I've not been successful in getting anything beyond the, the actual hybrid. Um, and that happens with some of the, the, the crosses. It's just not fertile after the, the hybrid. Here's one that's only identified with the plant introduction number. When, before I came, there were some plant, some seed sent um, to the program here that was labeled Rubus ideus from Russia. And looking at the top two pictures, it's Rubus, yes, but it's not Rubus ideus by any means. Um, I made a cross between that and red raspberry, and you can see that in the, the bottom left corner that it shows that it's set seed very well. Um, so fertility is not an issue. Um, the middle panel, um, these three rows here are um, the hybrids. And they're wonderful. They're growing real well and vigorous. And these plants here are dying from root rot. Um, so one of the things I got out of this parent is root rot tolerance. Um, Another is long laterals, fruiting laterals. Uh, unfortunately, also thorns, but after about one or two generations of selecting against those thorns, um, I've been able to, to eliminate the worst of those. And I've been continuing to use it as a parent crossed with the, the whatever hybrid I come up with crossed back to, to red raspberry. Um, and I've got some that are very, very um, pretty much indistinguishable from red raspberry, but they continue to have good levels of root rot tolerance. So that was a, a successful uh, use of germplasm. Okay, a little more information on red raspberry. The plant is behaves pretty much like a perennial. Um, however, the canes are biennials. Um, the first year canes are called primocanes and they are strictly vegetative um, and they send up straight, pretty much straight shoots, uh, canes that, that don't generally branch. Um, there's leaves from each of the nodes, but that's it. The second year, um, those canes, the buds break and form the fruiting laterals, which can be any place from oh, maybe a foot long to four or five or if you use too much nitrogen, they can be longer than that. And you'll get fruit on the second year canes um, on those fruiting laterals. And then after they've fruited, those canes will die. Um, while the second year canes are producing fruit, there's new first year canes that are being produced from the root, from buds on the roots. So in that case, it behaves like a uh, perennial. It just keeps, the plant itself keeps going and going, um, but the, the canes are biennial. To complicate it a little bit, there's also some types of the red raspberry which will produce fruit on the tips of the first year canes, and they'll produce fruit in the fall. Um, 
you can harvest just the fruit in the fall um, and then in the winter cut them back to the ground or you can um, just cut off the, the part of the cane that produces the fruit the tips of the of the of the, of the canes, um, and then get a, a summer crop and a fall crop in the second year. Um, with the for processing, it's almost exclusively floricane fruited, fruiting fruit. Uh, unlike a lot of crops, uh, all I need to do is to identify the plant I like, and then we clonally propagate it. Um, and that becomes a cultivar. Um, so all the plants are clonally propagated, um, so they're genetically identical. You can propagate it either from root cuttings or through tissue culture. And because they're all genetically identical, and you plant 40, 80 acres in a block, um, they need to be self-fertile. And there have been cases where selections have not been or they've been very poor at pollen production, and so those selections have been discarded. Okay, here's a picture of the fruit of red raspberry. Um, the little segments on the fruit are druplets. Um, they are something like a cherry, where there's a, it, it, which is a drupe, um, where there's a, a pit. They both have pits inside the, the um, drupe or druplets. Um, that in red raspberry you get 50 to 150 droplets per fruit depending on the cultivar. And they're attached to the receptacle which is this white part in the middle here and there's a vascular connection between the two so that's um, the way that the, the fruit increases in size. And then as the fruit gets ripe there, those um, abscise from the receptacle and so they slip off easier. And so this picture here is one that has the the fruit has come off of the plant and you get a fair amount of stability when you have the, re the receptacle in the fruit but when you remove it there's not much that holds that fruit together and that's been one of the real challenges to come up with a raspberry after it's picked will that will still be firm. Okay, the goals of the program, uh, flavor, firmness, and color, um, and what we look for in processing may be considerably different than what is um, goals for fresh market. We may call color, but they're different colors. We'd want much darker color for processing. They need to be machine harvestable, and we need to have you know, high yield, virus resistance, root rot tolerance, um, and then IQF quality. IQF is individual quick frozen. If you go to the store and buy a container of fruit, that frozen fruit that has individual fruit in the, in the container, that's IQF, and that's the highest priced fruit, uh, uh, processed fruit. So the general scheme is similar to most programs, select parents, make crosses, grow seedlings, um, make the selections and then evaluate them and then eventually release it. Uh, the WSU program has released 13 cultivars since it was started um, back in 1929 and the average length of time it's taken has been just under 16 years uh, from the time you make the cross to when it was released as a new variety. In the last few years, it's been the time has been around 13, 14, 15 years. Okay, pollinations. Uh, my program, we average about uh, average 74 crosses a year over the last five years. With the pollinations, generally emasculate three to five flowers per bag, and two to three bags per cross, and with the goal of getting 200 seeds per cross. Uh, we scarify the seed with concentrated sulfuric acid for 15 to 20 minutes and then sow the seed in the greenhouse and the goal is to get 100 seedlings per cross. And the average number of seedlings we've been planting in the last five years has been 5,500 seedlings and that would translate into three acres of the planting 
and if you're walking down the rows, it would translate to a bit over three miles of row. Okay, the next step is to make the selections. Um, I evaluate the selections two years after, the, after they've been planted in the field, and I evaluate all the fruiting seedlings at least once a week, and the goal is to select about 1% of the seedlings. Some years it's maybe half a percent, other years it's one and a half or two percent, depending on what the population is like. I'll go down the rows, sub subjectively evaluate them for vigor, um, which in the picture you see there, there's some plants that are dying because of root rot. And so one of the main things I'm selecting is tolerance to root rot, just because they're growing in that field. Uh, yield, I want to see plants that have a lot of fruit. Growth habit, uh, I don't want real long fruiting laterals, and they should be horizontal or upright. Uh, I don't want drooping uh, fruit laterals. And then also I'll make observations on the color, size, and appearance of the, of the fruit. All of that's while I'm just walking down the rows. If something looks promising, or encouraging at least, um, I'll stop and, and uh, see what the firmness of the fruit's like, how well the fruit comes off of the plant. And if it looks good for those, then I'll, I'll taste some. Um, and if it looks continues to look good, then we'll flag it and the seedlings and there'll be selections. And then we'll propagate the selections. We propagate the selections by tissue culture. Uh, one of, as, as in the last slide, you saw that we had a lot of root rot. If we dug up root material and propagated by the root material, we could very easily come up with some plants that are also have uh, root rot. And when I go to plant them with cooperating growers, uh, they wouldn't like that, and they would probably become uncooperating growers. Um, so we propagate from tissue culture. We collect a, the tip of the shoot from a, on a primocane, which could be any place from a foot to eight feet above the ground, and uh, place in a tissue culture and multiply it up, uh, root plants in the greenhouse, and then plant with a cooperating grower. And this is a grower's field with uh, 10 plant plots of uh, some of my selections. And they're grown under pretty much commercial practices. They're, and because they're tissue culture plants, they'll usually start off with a little bit lighter on the um, herbicides. And these would be harvested under a commercial schedule. And then I would evaluate how well they um, machine harvest. And here's a machine harvester. Um, unlike a lot of crops, we don't do a once-over harvest of, of these. They're harvested every day and a half to three days, depending on temperature and what product you're looking for. So during the season, they could be going, which usually is about uh, 25 to 30 days. Um, you could be going through the fields 15 to 20 times. Um, and so you have to have a pretty durable plant. Um, these are for processing. Uh, actually, the pr processing quality of the fruit is better with a machine than it is for um, hand harvested fruit. But there are several reasons. One is you can't pick the fruit by hand if you can't see it. And so if you get fruit in the middle of the plant, um, those may wind up being very overripe before, before somebody actually sees them and picks them. The other thing is, is if a person picks it, it's a judgment call as to whether the fruit is ripe enough. With machine harvesting, uh, it's strictly on how well the fruit releases, and so you come up with a much more uniform product, um, consistent, which, which is what you need for processing. And there's a couple companies in the Northwest that make machine harvesters, um, Litau and Oxbow are two of them. Here's looking in the inside of the harvester, these um, vertical columns. There's, there's two main uh, ways for the mechanisms. Um, one would be a vertical shaker where this would go up and down as it goes down through the row and that would 
uh, shake the plant, or it could be a lateral um, where it would go back and rotate back and forth uh, and shake the plant that way. The goal is not to hit the fruit, but to shake the plant so the fruit comes off of the, the plant. And here it's looking at the base, so the fruit rolls, falls down to here, and then it goes over into these uh, little cup-like things here, and then they go from there up to the top of the machine, and then they come out. They go through a blower, and then they come out on a little um, conveyor belt there and go into the um, flats. And you can operate this machine on two people, or it may have four people, depending on um, how much fruit is coming off at the time and what your end product is going to be. And so each week I go up there to the plots and subjectively evaluate the plots for uh, green, basically fruit defects problems, um, and then also make a subjective evaluation for yield, uh, make notes on color, size, firmness, and flavor. And then the ones that look like they have some promise, we'll collect a, about a 300 gram fruit sample, freeze it, and then later on analyze those for soluble solids, titratable acidity, pH, um, and anthocyanins. So the fruit we need um, is something that has an easy fruit re release, uh, firm fruit, durable, because it's going to bounce around a bit um, before it gets onto the belt. Uh, good lateral length, um, you don't want it too long um, or it could break fairly easily. And then also good lateral attachment so that it, the laterals don't break off. Now I'm going to go through a bunch of traits that, are, that affect how well things machine harvest. I haven't done a formal study on these, but um, just looking at enough raspberry plants and raspberry fruits, um, I think these are some, a lot of the things that we would want to get or, to, or a lot of these that we'd like to avoid. Uh, the first one is abscission of the pedicel. You can see here that these have the stem on them, um, that they're, they're breaking off there before the fruit ever gets ripe. And so that's one that you avoid, but you can't really see it when you're going selecting as a seedling. So you, it's when you first machine harvest it that you discover these problems. Second one is abscission from the receptacle. Uh, Cascade Dawn is one that I released that probably is one of the best flavored one I've had, but it doesn't like to come off of the receptacle until it is absolutely ripe. And so with the machine harvester, that doesn't work well. Um, and so you want something that, that causes or abscises from the receptacle at the proper time. You don't want it too early or the fruit wouldn't be ripe, although that's usually not a problem. Um, it's avoiding the, the late ones. Fruit cohesion. Um, you can see there's all sorts. It's, it's basically a bunch of droplets in the flat. Um, there's several causes. Um, there's a virus that will cause crumbly fruit. If there's poor weather during pollination, you can also have crumb, crumbly fruit. And then there's mutations that can cause that or just the genes that it inherited, it just decides it's going to crumble, it's not going to hold together real well. There can be issues with the receptacle shape. You look at this one here and there's a pronounced shoulder um, and so if the fruit is like this and wraps over the top of the, the uh, receptacle, when it comes off it's going to probably break off some of the droplets at the top. You want something like this that's nice and, and tapered. Um, I like the smoothness of this, but this one harvests, harvests very well. Okay, abscission from the or receptacle length. Th this receptacle isn't too long, but I could see, I could conceive of others that would be longer that would um, delay the fruit from coming off of the plant. Fruit firmness. Um, once it's off of the, the plant, uh, fruit firmness is a real issue. Uh, we 
did a number of studies 25 years ago where we measured a lot of different morphological parameters of the fruit and did multiple regression and uh, path analysis. And we only really came up with about an R squared of 0.1. So it's something we're not measure, measuring. Um, the, the couple things that are correlated with that are fruit size. The bigger fruit usually is firmer. And also, um, or the, and the droplet size, um, the bigger uh, fruit is, is firmer. And seed size, um, not all of those are desirable traits. Okay, here's um, one that it, it, it has some characteristics I like. Um, the fruit here is it's what I term a meaty raspberry, where the length from the inside of the, of the uh, fruit to the outside is fairly long. So it has a lot of contact area between the droplets here. The other thing is, is this is the droplets are in a nice even um, plane um, with this as opposed to this one here, which there's a notch in the top, and that predisposes it to break. Um, long, weak laterals, you lose fruit because it gets caught up into the, the leaves and doesn't drop through. Um, also, you can um, have um, the laterals breaking, like you can see over here. So. We screen for machine harvesting as soon as possible. I make the selection, and if possible, we plant it the next year in a, one of the machine harvesting plantings. Uh, the machine harvestability is probably not a single trait. It's, it's a combination of several to many unrelated traits. And unfortunately, you need to have at least it be at least adequate for just about all the traits. It doesn't do any good if it releases, it sizes real well if it also sizes at the receptacle, or I mean at the uh, pedestal before the fruit's ever ripe. Um, so you need to have all the traits at least being acceptable. Um, for now, it's strictly empirical that I make my best guesses on the selections in the seedling field. And we put it in the machine harvesting as soon as we can, and then uh, determine whether it actually does machine harvest. Uh, some of the growers said, well, if you move it even earlier, could you select seedlings um, as you're machine harvesting them? And so we put in a study. Uh, we put in 2,160 plants uh, in a grower field. And in concept, it's, it's very straightforward. You'd simply uh, run the harvester over the field, and when the fruit comes across the belt and you find something that looks promising, you have them flag the, the plant, you know, select the plant. Uh, there's a few glitches, though. Um, it is doable, though. Uh, one is the fruit that comes across the belt here. It doesn't come out in um, one s nice defined clump. Um, the fruit takes a little while to come um, from, from the time it, it's harvested to going up to the top of the machine, and some of them have a lot, little bit more bouncy path than the other, so it's spread out. Um, another thing is that the fruit that's on the right side of the, the row will arrive at the belt quicker than the one on the left side. Because on the right side, all it needs to do is go up to the top here and in across the blower. On this side, it needs to go up to the top across the machine and then through the blower. So there's a, there's a um, longer path for the ones on the left side of the machine. So you could have a bimodal distribution. What all this winds up doing is spreading it out, causing a fair amount of overlap between one uh, seedling and the next seedling, or fruit of one seedling and the next one. Um, so, but you can you can work with it. The next one is decision making time, from the time it comes out of the blower to the when it drops off of the the belt, it's roughly about five seconds. 
so you have about five seconds to decide is the fruit on this one desirable? Um, is it the right color? Um, is it coming through intact? Um, you might be able to pick up some and, and see if it has firmness. You probably wouldn't have time to taste them. Uh, so it's a quick decision and it's mostly based on appearances. The next one, uh, sorry, um, the next one is concentration. Uh, it takes about three to four hours to go through that size of a planting. And making decisions every five seconds, uh, after a while you begin to get your concentration, my, at least my concentration will waver every once in a while. So that's a challenge to keep focused on the attributes that I'm looking for. And then finally, uh, finding the correct plant. The fruit that's coming across the belt is not from the fruit that's directly, or plant that's directly below you. It's about seven, eight, nine plants behind. Um, it takes quite a while for it to, to come up to the, to the belt. And um, the time it takes me to make the decision may vary a little bit, so that might add another play of, an, of a plant or two. And if there's something I like, I then have to tell the, the operator of the machine to stop the machine. And it may take him a little while, and then they'll um, have to look and see the person following behind the machine will have to figure out which is the right plant. Um, it works reasonably well uh, because that you'll see these nice, bright, white receptacles of freshly picked fruit. So a seedling that has a lot of them, um, is, that's an encouraging sign. Uh, it does seem to work that some weeks when the person on the ground is, is flagging things, they'll be on the right side of the harvester or on right side of the row. Other weeks they'll be on the left. And there's been times when one week they'll flag the seedling on the right side, the next week they'll flag the same seedling on the, the left side. So obviously we're selecting for the same thing on that. And it does work in that we had two selections um, out of, I don't know, there were maybe 40 or more that, that were selected in the field that um, have good enough quality. They're currently in grower trials. Now the question is, would they have been selected if it was if it was just done on the ground? And since it's not a replicated study with those that harvest better and that, we don't know. I would hope that I would have selected it, but I'm not positive. Okay, after they've been evaluated for machine harvestability, that we replant the best ones in a new machine harvesting trial, and then also in replicated plantings um, at Puyallup. We'll hand harvest those twice each week um, and measure or you know weigh the good fruit, the rotten fruit, um, weight of 25 fruit, and fruit firmness on five fruit. And we'll do that twice a week. Uh, OK, and the another very big problem is raspberry root rot. It's a phytophthora. It's more severe on wet or poorly drained sites. Uh, once you have it established in your field, it doesn't really disappear. You can fumigate, um, and that may eliminate it from the surface, but it comes back. Um, the record course of action is to raise beds. That helps on the drainage. Gypsum, the calcium, uh, seems to help. And then some fungicides. Uh, but the main one is to plant re tolerant cultivars. The, the farm my seedlings are at um, is naturally infested with good levels, if you're a pathologist, uh, good levels of root rot. It provides a natural screen for the seedlings. But there are some that just happen to be in the right spot in the right year and are susceptible, but um, we don't catch them. Um, but we do catch them later on that after they've been through machine harvesting uh, evaluations, um, the next thing they do is go into the, the 
replicated plots, but we also plant them in an area that we know have root rot. And so those that escaped earlier should get caught here. And we evaluate them for three or four years on this site. Another nasty disease is raspberry bushy dwarf virus, or RBDV. Uh, the, there's no vegetative difference for most of the plants. Some will have yellow foliage if they're, if they're virus infected, but most don't. Uh, really, um, the, the, the name was a misnomer. It was a, infected with more than one virus. However, the, the effect you see is on the fruit. The one on the left is a normal fruit and it doesn't have the virus, and the one on the right um, has the virus, has many fewer droplets, and when you pick it, the fruit is liable to crumble. So it's a pollen-borne virus, so you can't exclude the vector, which is pollen, um, or else you won't get fruit. It systemically infects the plant, so once it is infected, um, the new shoots coming up from the ground will also test positive, um, and if you're in a breeding program, it can be transmitted to the seeds as well. It causes partial sterility of the fruit, so the fruit crumbles. Uh, estimated impact of RBDV if you're growing a susceptible cultivar and if you're growing it for IQF quality is over $1,500 an acre a year. And it's probably much more than that because that estimate was done about 10, 15 years ago. You, the, re, that number is derived from losses in yield. Uh, losses in fruit quality, so you can't grow it, sell it for IQF fruit. It goes for juice or some, some other low-grade product. And then the growers wind up taking out the field after five or six years and then having to replant. And normal length of without this problem is more in the order of 10 to 12 years. And there's obviously there's no cultural management options other than replant with clean plants. Uh, but there's no significant plantings of any RBDV-resistant cultivars in the Northwest currently. Part of that is the people that make the buying decisions on the fruit are interested in the fruit. They're not interested in the disease resistance of the plant so that the grower can have an easier time growing it. They want the fruit that they want as long as they can get it. Um, that that's what they'll they'll try to get. Uh, the way we determine whether something is susceptible or not is by grafting, um, graft inoculate. You remove the terminal leaflet here and then take a leaf from an infected plant and graft it onto this leaf and also this leaf here and then cover it with a, a pop bottle for a few weeks and then you can do an um, antibody test a LISA test and see whether or not the plant tests positive for it. It's slow. It takes several weeks and it um, is laborious to, to graft. Uh, single gene um, is a dominant trait. should be easy to breed for it, but it's been very, very difficult. Um, part of it's only symptoms in the fruit and the seedlings fruit for the first time two years after planting. That's also when you evaluate it. So even if it's susceptible, you're not going to see any traits um, that would it wouldn't be expressed at that stage. So we don't screen the seedlings or the new selections um, at that time. Uh, we simply do graphs on the ones that um, we're considering to, to maybe release. Markers. Markers would be wonderful for RBDV root rot, um, also for aphid resistance. I don't know if we could do anything for um, machine harvestability. Uh, at Cornell, uh, we worked with the breeder there, and we uh, graft inoculated seedlings from across and sent him uh, leaf material. They screened a bunch of markers, and two markers were correct 58 out of 60 times. Um, which is, you know, definitely would help the program. However, uh, when you start going into other crosses with different parents, 
uh, those markers just fell apart. And then uh, root rot tolerance, um, again, some work done at Cornell. We were not involved with that. Um, they came up with Q two QTLs, which accounted for 25 to, to 60 percent of the variability, which is progress, but not in, as much as I would like. Um, aphid resistance, there's been some work being done on black raspberries, and that any, any markers that would be developed for black raspberries should transfer over to uh, red raspberries as well. Here's a picture of Cascade Harvest, uh, which is the newest release from my program. Um, it is root rot tolerant. It machine harvests well. Um, it's RBDV resistant to the common strain of RBDV. Um, it has good flavor. Uh, so we'll see how it works. That was just released winter of 2013. For if you're looking for more information, I would suggest uh, plant breeding reviews. There was a whole book devoted to raspberry breeding and genetics, um, volume 32, um, but that has a lot of information on red raspberries. And here's a picture I got from uh, uh, Chad Finn, who's the breeder down in Oregon. Um, the, there's the three Northwest breeding programs. On the left is the Oregon program. The middle is the Washington, and the one on the right is the uh, BC program, and pictures of the breeders from each of those programs. The top one is uh, C.E. Schuster, and then George Darrow, uh, George Waldo, and then Whitey Lawrence, and then Chad Finn here. Um, in the WSU program, there's um, Chet Schwartz, and then Bruce Barrett, who was at Puyallup for 10 years, and then went to Wenatchee. And, took up a career as an apple breeder, and he's since retired. Um, the one below him is, is Tom Shalin, who was the uh, breeder prior to me, and uh, he left and uh, got a job with Driscoll's and has since retired from Driscoll's. And then me. On the far right is the BC program, uh, Hugh Dobney, um, then uh, Heim Kempler, and then Michael Dossett. And each of the program has had a highly significant um, contribution to the raspberry industry. Uh, Willamette was developed out of the Oregon program, Meeker out of the Washington, and both of those at their times were the leading uh, sold variety in the Northwest, and uh, Meeker still is. Um, and then Tulamine was, came out of the BC program from Hugh Dobney, and it was, uh, it's still a standard for fresh market uh, raspberries. With that, um, I'm done with that. So, any questions? So, thank you very much, Dr. Moore. Uh, now, mm -hmm. so we have time for some questions. Mm -hmm. And for those who missed the beginning uh, of the presentation, you can use the question box on your screen to type in question and hit return. And I will uh, ask these questions to Dr. Moore. Um, so, we already have actually some questions. So, I will begin. Uh, right now, and the questions are flying, so that's good. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so carry on. Uh, I will, we will uh, answer as many as possible. So first, uh, we had a question of somebody uh, wanting more um, more details about the reason why you do uh, tissue culture for propagation and not cutting. So you mentioned uh, which what which what control is there other diseases and other re reason why you you do uh, tissue tissue culture? Yeah, the big reason is is for the root rot um, issues that um, since they're normally propagated by um, root material. Um, to exclude all the the phytophthora in the soil that's in contact to, to the roots would be very difficult. Um, so we do tissue culture um, because you've got the shoots up in the air that are not in contact with the ground and so should be free of uh, phytophthora. But we still surface sterilize when we put it in, in tissue culture. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
So for the people to whom I answer the questions, if you have more details or you can re-ask a question or tell me if it's good. Um, okay, so I have also the questions about um, uh, the uh, varieties in general. So I actually have a couple of questions for that. So one of them is what is the percentage of uh, raspberry varieties um, orig originating from uh, public uh, versus commercial uh, breeding programs? In the Northwest, there, let's see, Meeker is about 42 or 43 percent of the plant sales. Um, I'm, I may be confusing Northwest with, with the other. Um, I'd say it's probably around 70% is from public programs, um, and the main ones that are used in um, the Northwest for processing are uh, most, there, there's one private program that released a, a variety that, that's being planted now. So it's, yeah, it's around 70%. And so uh, I have another question related to that is how uh, is the turnover of uh, varieties uh, and how many, is there a lot of varieties and are there a lot of changes from the, the, um, um, the growers to look for new varieties or it's a slow process? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's a slow process. When I started in 87, uh, Willamette was the most widely grown raspberry in the Northwest, and Willamette was released in 1943. Oh, so, yeah. um, and it just, just in the last two or three years, uh, the propagators have stopped propagating that. Meeker is now the number, is still the number one. Um, it's took over number one about 1990 or so. Um, and it was released in 1967, um, and the main reason it, it was accepted over Willamette um, is it has considerably higher yield um, and a little bit better um, root rot tolerance in winter. Um, it, it depends on the year, um, but the machine, it, it didn't machine harvest very well because it had fairly long fruit laterals. Um, they did some modifications of the machines um, to accommodate the large, the more vigorous plants um, and so they could get the higher yields. Uh, there was reluctance to change because uh, Meeker is considerably lighter in color than Willamette, but the growers shifted to Meeker and, and the rest of the industry did as well. Okay. Good. So then I have a lot of questions about markers and uh, uh, QTL genetic in general. So uh, first, I think to give us uh, an idea, somebody asked, is uh, a raspberry genome had been sequenced? Um, there's been some work done on that. Um, I don't, there's been preliminary publications on it. I'm not sure if the full genome has been published or not. And so, quite related question, but that do you think that uh, using information, genetic information as marker QTLs or even sequences genes already known in other uh, rose family would be helpful and have you done work on that? Um, I haven't done the work on that, but on the um, RBDV marker, uh, what they did was they found uh, or, or did s just simply screened a bunch of markers, uh, came up with one that uh, worked fairly well, but it didn't work for some of the resistant ones. It would label them as being susceptible. Um, so they went into the strawberry gene, or yeah, strawberry genome, and found a um, virus resistance gene that was um, related to this to this marker um, sequence. Um, and use that, and that also was one that, that worked uh, 58 out of 60 times, but um, it didn't hold up with when other parents were used. Okay. There's the, prob the problem is, is we're a small community, and 
Um, yeah. Yeah, the the critical mass. We'll we'll get there, but <laughs> the critical mass right now is the challenge. And um, and for markers and genetic again, um, how? So you you mentioned you have some markers developed. So what is the uh, the kind? What what are those markers? And uh, is there any other work to develop more more markers? And what what's been used marker wise? Um, my program, we haven't used any of them. Um, okay. We, we we cooperated with Cornell um, on the RBDV. Um, where we infected the plants and, and so we rated them as susceptible and resistant based on on that. Uh, but they they were the ones that actually developed the markers. There's been a fair amount of work being done in uh, the breeding program in Scotland and also to some extent in, in East Malling. Um, okay. I know that. And and uh, uh, Michael Dossett has been doing a, a fair amount of work um, in BC. Um, but he's just been there a few years now. Okay. Um, I have also some questions about um, traits of interest for, for breeding. Uh, so uh, somebody asked uh, if there were any, um, excuse me, if the, uh, concentrated, the concentra concentrated fruiting was uh, in the breeding objective and, uh, and why not if it was not the case. Um, yes, it, 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 it is something I w would like to incorporate. Um, it's somewhat lower priority um, because they, the growers can get along, you know, running the machine another few times through the field it will make an economic impact, but they can do that. Whereas if you've got root rot or RBDV or it doesn't machine harvest, um, you know, those, those are ones that are much more um, important. Um, it, it's we we do there there is there's a little bit of variability in length of of fruiting season um, with with the data we collect and hand harvest at PUL, uh, we can generate the number of days from five percent to ninety five percent harvest and. It generally falls around 20 to 24 days, something in that range. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, kind of also uh, building uh, priorities and interest. Is there any effort to develop cultivars um, allowing cultivation outside of Pacific Northwest and there's more uh, tolerance to cold or drought or things like that. Is that, is that something going on? Um, that when we do develop a, a new variety, um, more on the fresh market side, if there's something that doesn't machine but it has good flavor and good other qualities, um, we would be interested in um, trying it in other locations. Um, California, but, for example? And um, probably more in Europe um, okay. or, or into Canada, more in Canada. Um, California is, is a different market and it would probably have to be a, a prime cane fruiting type um, okay. to do well. There are some others that aren't, but, but most of them are. Uh, still uh, different traits. Uh, is um, are there any research and interest for uh, seedless cultivars? There, there's been that mentioned. I don't know how. I don't know of any because um, there's a seed in every druplet, <laughs> um, <laughs> and th there's. I don't see, you know. Um, Aborted seeds, uh, you know, in in there where they, de yeah. if you get abortion, you you don't get um, the the droplet to to develop. So it'd be nice, but I don't know where w any sources of that would be. Okay, yeah. 
<laughs> available, yeah. Um, there are two related questions I will uh, put together. So, is there any self incompatibility and or any um, inbreeding depression um, restraining you to to make inbreeding line? And is there interest of doing that? Um, that there has been some work on um, inbreeding as a, a breeding method um, in Scotland, in, in particular, where they would self things and then cross them and then make selections and, and, and you know, so, so they would, they wouldn't repeatedly self towards, you know, trying to get homozygosity, but they were trying to eliminate negative traits um, by um, selfing for a generation and then outcrossing and then coming back um, like that. Um, okay. Variation for the traits we're, th my program's working on, there, there's a, a lot of potential for, for, for already with the germplasm we have. Mm, yeah. Mm. Um, there is question about fruit quality. So, um, uh, so I bet there is. So, uh, is there varietal differences for anthocyanin content, and how how much can it vary? How big is it variation? Well, we'll get numbers like fifty. Oh, gee. I don't know the units, uh, <laughs> milligrams per, I don't know, gram or whatever it is. Um, but anyway, 50 units. We've had, we have a selection which has um, 180. So we can get over the triple bonus. the amount of anthocyanins. Um, and then there are some that are on the lower side that are down, you know, in the 40s. Um, which at least gives you some range. So there's there's considerable variation. Um, you would want to be in the lower end for fresh generally, um, because they would look they would appear to be um, not as not overripe. Um, but for processing, I don't know if they'd want to go to 180. But mm. Willamette is around 100 to 130, depending on how ripe it is. Um, okay. Um, I have an interesting question about uh, when you are looking in um, a wild species, what are the traits um, you are actually looking for and uh, the person especially asks for sim, sim blue, I'm sorry I would butcher the name, sim blueberry, sim bulberry? Hmm, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can uh, write it to you somewhere. Um, Thimbleberry, it's... Uh, oh, Thimbleberry, okay. Yeah, that's one, sorry. Okay. Um, so, trait of interest in this uh, wild species and in other wild species in general. Yeah. Um, it really was just curiosity more than anything at, at, at early on. Um, and so I went and looked through the germplasm repository um, which is at Corvallis, um, and looked for s different species material that was diploid, um, and got as many of those as I could, and then crossed those with red raspberry, basically just to see whether or not it was possible to cross them, um, what the fertility was, um, and then after it was in a usable, more usable um, state than, than looking more for traits. Uh, so the first uh, basic selection criteria, if we, got the F1, if we got the hybrids, was to select for fertility. Uh, yeah. The flavor, color, the rest of those traits was, was secondary. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the initial work. But mm -hmm. then later on we, were, we would put them in plots and, and yeah, we, we've got a few that are several generations in. Okay. Uh, I have an interesting comment and actually I had a personal one too uh, which are a little bit related um, about the, the seedling. Um, 
the selection for ma 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 machine harvesting directly on seedling. Uh, so mm -hmm. somebody um, is uh, suggesting and as if you've tried and thought about using black raspberry as spacer in between different seedlings um, to make sure that um, you know you're not confusing too much. Yeah. Uh, and and I was I was thinking about just setting space in between the right uh, in between in between seedlings. Is that something you thought about? Would it keep uh, the efficiency of of the system even if they are more spaced? Um, didn't really think about it for the for the seedling selections. Um, that might help some, um, but it was. Let's see how many acres was that? Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. It was two or three acres. Um, yeah. The, the 2,000 seedlings. Um, so it would basically double the size of the plant. Yeah. We went with a little bit wider spacing than normal. Um, yeah. But obviously, because we were selecting things one week and then selecting it again the next week, um, we were finding the same flagging the same um, selections, um, so it, it 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 there may be a few errors in the system, but it seemed to work fairly well. well. We were at one time talking about planting some yellow raspberries uh, between oh. um, the machine harvesting plots, mm -hmm. uh, but decided that yeah there, w there's a we we leave a gap of. Um, maybe five feet between one plot and the next, and, and that's enough to separate it. Yeah, okay. Um, let's go for last question. Um, and uh, let's go, actually I have several, so I have to choose one. Uh, let's go for, <laughs> um, okay, somebody is asking, uh, slash suggesting, um, did you use a GWAS, so genome-wide genome, um, genome assisted selection um, for for marker. Well, um, sorry. Think, I think what the person is asking is, uh, did you have you thought about and uh, would you be willing to use um, sequencing um, sequencing Genetic select, uh, sorry, sequencing um, markers, sequencing genomic methods to to develop markers. Um. So to to sequence uh, your your populations uh, to get mm -hmm. and and we see only the polymorphic um, the polymorphic information of your sequences for for your population. Um, right now, I think what I would be more interested in it would be was would be cooperating with somebody, um, you know, on that that is is working on trying to develop markers, um, and I'd be you know willing to um, see validate the markers if, if, if that people might come up with. Mm -hmm. um, There's a phenotypic study and uh, yeah. 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 Okay, good. Well, on uh, that, uh, I think we've run out of time, and uh, I'd I'd like to thank you all for your questions and for being here. And uh, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar, as well as other webinars from this series, will be available uh, at the extension.org slash penbreeding genomics uh, website. So thank you so much again for joining us, Dr. Moore, and thank you to our audience for, for coming. Have a nice day.